What's up guys, Jeff Cavalier, AthleteX.com. Today we are breaking out four muscle markers. That's right, we're going to put the science back in strength because we got to answer this question that I get asked all the time and that is to what degree can we influence our chest and the development of our chest through our training? Can we hit the specific areas? And we all have areas, guys. You guys, I mean, I look in the mirror, you guys are kind enough to tell me about how I have an indentation on my chest on one side versus the other. They're not completely symmetrical at the bottom. I wasn't even aware of that until you guys told me that. But the fact is, we see different areas. Maybe the upper chest needs to be more filled out. Maybe you, you don't like the fact that you just see one blended area here on the outside of your chest. It looks like all rib cage. The lower chest, you guys don't have any defining bottom portion. Is there anything that can be done about any of these areas? Well, we're going to break these guys out to help us to see that. So first and foremost, I think it helps to sort of start determining what it is that you're probably seeing in the mirror. What are you likely looking at? If I were to take out a muscle marker here and I were to try to say, hey, what can I do as far as top or bottom? Well, we know that we actually have two areas of the pecs here. And you can see that even just when I contract a little bit, we get this outline of the delt here, which frames up against the clavicle. And right about this shaded area over here, we come in and we're looking at the upper pec, right? The upper portion of the pec. They call it the clavicular portion of the pec because the fibers run in this direction here from the clavicle, this bone right here, the clavicle, and then down out to our humerus here, the groove on our humerus. So it's going to have an impact on our arm motion because we're going to go from our origin to the insertion on the arm. So we know that that's going to be able to happen. But we also have this whole big area of the pec that we know is the sternal portion. So when we look at the sternal portion, now we're talking about the fibers that run from the sternum and again up towards that same point. And we'll talk about, as we have in the past, that there is a portion here of the lower fibers that angle more upward just because of the angle here, knowing that the sternum comes down and out and spreads a little bit, that these fibers run at more of an up angle. Okay, so let's draw them in purple. I do have a purple muscle marker, guys. Come up in this direction. And some anatomists have actually called this the abdominal head. Okay, but it is two major portions, and we talk about the two major portions of the pec. Why? Really because there's two separate nerve innervations. Okay, so we have the lateral pectoral nerve that hits the clavicular portion, and we have the medial pectoral nerve that hits the sternal portion. So if we were in a lab, and only in a lab, if we were to isolate that nerve and stimulate that nerve, we could theoretically get a contraction of one, either the upper pecs or the lower pecs, just by stimulating that nerve. But that's not what happens when we talk about real life, guys. We don't have the ability to isolate a nerve like that you know, in a lab setting and get that response. We know that when we move the arm, the arm actions themselves require that the, both of those nerves are going to fire, so we're not getting an isolation of the two. However, what we do have, if you come back in again, is you have the opportunity to influence the muscle fibers in these two areas because we know that we can do what I always say we can do and that is to follow the fibers. Knowing that, we've talked about in the past, and you'll see some of the exercises here as I demonstrate them, that when we can take this arm from this position here and move it up and across the body like that, we're preferentially following these fibers, putting them in a better line of pull, giving them a better chance to actually influence the movement. So we know we can do that here. And we can do the same here as we cross our body this way through full adduction across the body, knowing that these fibers that are oriented more in a parallel orientation here can pull the arm more in this direction and have a better influence there. And then, of course, from the lower pecs, we know if we start with our arm high and come down low, we're getting this orientation now, which is preferentially going to allow us to hit and better develop these areas down in the lower portion of the chest. And that's actually something that science has proven now. But what about the other areas. What about this area over here, this whole inner chest area, get that microphone out of the way, and what about, as I talked about in the, in the beginning, this kind of outer pec area, right? Can we do anything about this? Well, here's where science gets a little bit more complicated but interesting. What we're talking about now is we're talking about two areas that don't have separate nerve innervation, that don't allow us to do anything very special for it until we realize that there is something called non-spanning fibers. 
And non-spinning chest fibers ties into the concept of fascia. And fascia, guys, is one of the areas that we don't really pay much attention to. And a lot of times when an anatomy book draws out and shows us our muscles perfectly, or even on our own Raymond, when we look at the muscles, we get to see the nice red muscles with none of the white fascia covering them that we would see if we actually were open up our own bodies. Don't do that. It's not safe. But the fact is that fascia is extremely influential on the overall performance of a muscle because it has its own force transmission capabilities. So what happens is, back to these non-spanning fibers, we actually have some muscle fibers that come from either side, either from the origin or the insertion, that don't make it all the way through. They might only originate from one bone, tendon, into the muscle itself, and then die off. Or you'll get some from the outside that will originate from the outside here, the insertion, and then die off. They don't span, they're not myotendinous, meaning they don't go from bone to tendon to muscle to tendon to bone. They don't make it all the way across. So how, what is the purpose of these? Why do they even exist and can we do anything about it at all? Well, we know that through the fascia, as we contract a muscle, the more force we can contract a muscle with, the more we can actually help to, to have that transmit through the fascia itself that's surrounding that muscle, and that fascia can actually help to keep that, that force transmission going, and then therefore involve these non-spinning fibers that would not have an opportunity to be engaged because they don't attach to the other side. And that's how we realize we can actually get more force transmission and development. Now, does that mean we could do anything specifically about this? No, but there's one thing you should always be doing, and that is go through a full range of motion. So we talk about the full range of motion, come on down. We talk about the full range of motion, as I go through a full range of motion, I'm giving myself a better opportunity to start picking up some of the activation here of these fibers, not to mention getting a complete chest contraction. When we talk about the outer area of the pec here, I talk about being able to position yourself through maximum stretch, meaning don't perform your exercises with rounded shoulders, but get your shoulders back, immediately taking this insertion point back further from the origin. Get a bigger stretch, and then apply tension in that position of the range of motion. Don't just rush through your exercises. When you get down to the bottom position, whether it be through a dip, as you see me doing here, or whether it be through a bench press, as you see me doing here, allow for a rest pause there. Pause at the bottom of that rep to allow yourself to experience the tension in that elongated state. And again, when you come back through your range of motion, don't stop here. Bench presses alone are not going to give you maximal development of your chest, but hold on for a minute when I talk about the value of that. It doesn't give you maximum development because you're not taking that pec muscle through its full range of motion. So if you want to give yourself even a chance to do something about developing a muscle as completely as possible, take it through its full range. Don't stop here. Go all the way across through full adduction to give yourself the best chance. Again, no, no chance for me to fill in this gap here, guys. But what I can do is go through that full range of motion. Now, where does that bench press fit into this equation here? It should fit as the foundation for your pressing exercises. If you're trying to develop your chest, you want to start with the bench press. Why? After all I just said, why? Why? Because you're able to uh, load that exercise with maximal tension that's not going to be possible through any of the other exercises that you can do for your chest. Whether you're a fan of flies, which I'm not, or whether you're a fan of crossovers, which, which I am more, you still can't load the chest muscle with as much mechanical overload and tension that you can through a bench press. So you fill that as your foundation, but to stop there would lead to an incomplete chest development. Realizing that I can't just continue to go in this plane of motion. It, it, ignoring the fact that I'm not changing the angle. Ignoring the fact that I'm not changing the angle. Ignoring the fact that I'm not getting through full range of motion. Ignoring the fact that I'm, I'm missing a lot of other key components. So, guys, when it comes to targeting your chest, you have some options, but the biggest answer is this. A complete uh, development of your chest is going to require that you understand the different angles that your arm can move in, understand the influence that's going to have on the different areas, and always, always, always strengthen yourself through a maximum range of motion. Realize that certain exercises don't take you all the way through there. You're going to have to pick and choose some that allow you to complete that and make sure that the joint moves through its full range of motion to fully activate the muscle. If you're looking for a program, guys, that breaks it all down, puts the science back in strength in every workout we do, selects the exercises that complement each other so you get the best end result, that's over at athletenext.com. In the meantime, guys, if you're looking for more videos, tell me what you want to see, what you want me to cover. I'll do my best to do that for you in the days and weeks ahead. All right, see you soon.